a feature of and care. Um, I think we've got quite a big group of colleagues from all over the world at this seminar. So um, it's, it's an honor for me, Navina Evans. I am Chief Workforce Training and Education Officer at NHS England here in, uh, in, in London. Um, and it's a real honor for me to uh, open and chair this session. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, uh, points to make. Um, uh, we are all here from all over the world. All of our all of our views are relevant. All of our views are important to consider. This is going to be, I hope, a really rich um, discussion. So, of course, I don't need to remind us, but let's just remember uh, that some civility, respect and dignity for one another is uh, really important today. Um, also, just around using the yeah. seminar format, yeah. if you're speaking, please uh, do keep your camera on so that we can see you and get a sense of, of, uh, of, of who you are. And if you're not speaking, uh, it's a distraction, so we would ask to keep your camera off. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to start now um, with a yeah. short uh, film. I will hand over uh, uh, for that to happen. Thank you. Dr. Navina Evans, dear colleagues and friends, globally, the world has more health workers than ever before, but they are not distributed in proportion to need. In fact, just 10 high income countries account for almost a quarter of the world's doctors, nurses and midwives, many of whom are recruited internationally. In contrast, the 55 countries in Africa bear the largest share of the global burden of disease but have less than 5% of doctors, nurses, and midwives. Let me repeat these numbers. 10 countries have about 25% of the world's doctors, nurses, and midwives. And 55 countries have less than 5%. That's why WHO has consistently highlighted the challenges from underinvesting in education and employment and from unsustainable migration. We know the dangerous consequences that unchecked migration of health workers can have on under-resourced health systems. This is not a new issue. The World Health Assembly discussed it 20 years ago. This event is an opportunity to come together to find creative and bold ways to address these huge challenges. As health workforce leaders, you are key in advancing solutions in education, employment, retention, and ethical health worker migration, and to help guarantee the right to health for all. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tedros. Um, uh, I, I have to say, I was a bit blown away to get a mention, <laughs> a name check. So uh, that's made my day. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I, I, I suppose I just wanted to say, uh, absolutely from my perspective, uh, supporting Tedros's call for countries to take action on ethical international healthcare worker migration. Um, here in NHS England, we really know uh, how much this means to us in our country. Um, and we are thinking about our responsibility to reduce reliance on our internationally sourced health workforce. They've made an amazing contribution to the NHS in England, but we also have a responsibility as part of the global health workforce. Um, we have the long-term workforce plan. We have an equality, diversity, uh, and inclusion improvement plan. And this, these two plans recognize the importance of diaspora in delivering um, our services. But we also recognize that sustainable long-term transformation 
does rely on Western economies training as many staff as they require, even if those staff move in and out of our own systems. So we in NHS England have committed to three big parts in our plan, training, retention and reform uh, of our, our own healthcare workforce to meet the needs of our future uh, in this country in a sustainable and uh, ethical way. And my colleague Jed Byrne will give some examples in his presentation. Now, our organisations in England do not actively recruit from those countries in, um, uh, in the WHO recognised as having the most pressing health and care workforce related challenges, unless there is a government to government agreement to support managed recruitment activities. So we are increasingly looking to work with all our uh, partners uh, across the world to resolve uh, our mutual workforce issues. Now, we have a variety of perspectives on our panel today, including policymakers and leaders from source and destination countries. So I'm really looking forward to all panelists and viewers engaging in discussions in good faith, as I said earlier, sharing perspectives and respect, being curious for the perspective of others. Uh, we will also have approximately one uh, one hour or so of the presentations and then an hour for Q&A. So each speaker, I hope, will stimulate the discussion by posing one question at the end of their presentation. And this question is meant to make us reflect on a specific topic and start a debate uh, amongst ourselves. So please use the chat section of Zoom to share your views in, uh, on the question. And please make sure you send your answers to everyone, not to hosts and panelists. Um, please also feel free to ask your own questions to the speakers, which we will do our very best to address in the Q&A session later. I have a fantastic team of people in the room here helping me to do that. Um, um, and please ask your all your questions to the speakers in the Q&A field of Zoom. We are also recording this session and the recording will be made available with yourselves in the next few days. Right, I'm now delighted to introduce our speakers who will each have 10 minutes to present. And uh, speakers, I'm warning you, I will be letting you know when you have one minute left. So um, I hope I don't have to cut you off. Please don't make me be rude um, uh, if you go over your 10 minutes. Now, um, a quick introduction. Our first speaker will be Dr. Agya Mahat. She's a technical officer with the uh, WHO's Health Workforce Department, where she manages the portfolios on regulation and international migration of health workers. Our second speaker is Howard Catton. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the International Council of Nursing. Our third speaker is Professor Jed Byrne. He is the Director of Global Health Unit at NHS England. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Maggie Raving Ravangani. She is a Senior Manager at the National Department of Health in South Africa. And our fifth and final speaker is uh, Professor Padam, sorry, I've got a block here, Sim, uh, Padam Simkada. He is Associate Dean and International uh, Associate Dean International and Professor of Global Health at our very own University of Huddersfield. Okay, I think I may even be um, ahead of time, which is good, but that doesn't mean everybody gets extra minutes, can I just say? All right, so without further ado, I will hand off to our first speaker, um, Dr. Agia Mahat. Thank you. Namaste. Um, next slide, please. No, uh, the international migration of health workers from low and middle income countries to high income countries is uh, actually not a new phenomena. But in the past a couple of years, uh, it, there, it has received increased uh, media attention all over the world. Uh, next slide. And according to the data available with WHO, uh, worldwide, almost 3 million health workers are working outside of their country of birth or training. This means that more than one in 10 health workers worldwide is a migrant. In 21 high-income countries, more than one in five, health, uh, five doctors are trained in another country. And 1.1 million migrant workers are in uh, OECD countries alone. 
And this is equivalent to the entire stock of nurses in, the w, uh, in countries in WHO's African region. And all these numbers are actually an underestimate of the global situation because not all countries report this detailed data. And also because this does not include the health and care workers, um, the health workers from um, low and middle income countries who are working as care workers or in other sectors in the destination countries. Since the beginning of this millennium, there has been a significant increase in the number of health workers who are migrating to high income countries, but this has rapidly accelerated after COVID. And this is because uh, there was already an increasing demand in the high income countries because of the increasing burden of chronic illnesses and the aging population. Uh, but COVID also had an effect on the health workers themselves in high income countries who chose uh, early retirement or uh, part-time practice because of exhaustion and burnout during uh, the pandemic. So the easy option to increase this gap uh, in high-income countries has been through international recruitment. Next slide. Uh, we all understand the push and pull factors of uh, migration. But large-scale migration of health workers can also be a sign of labor market failure. Low- and middle-income countries invest in the education of health workers, but are often uh, face challenges to employ them and offer decent working conditions, and therefore uh, face retention challenges. High-income countries, on the other hand, um, have increased employment opportunities but uh, the production has not kept in pace. And again, an easy fix has been to recruit uh, from other countries, uh, especially low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. As a result, uh, the distribution of health workers is highly uneven and often driven by demand rather than need. Uh, in fact, uh, the distribution of health workers is in most cases opposite uh, to the burden of disease, if we consider that as uh, being the need for health workers. Um, if you look at the two maps here, uh, one is of health worker density, and the other is the burden of disease per population. Uh, Africa has the largest burden of disease, but it only has 4% of the global stock of doctors, nurses, and midwives. Um, in contrast, 23% of the global stock of these health workers are based only in 10 high-income countries. And the same countries um, are continuing to attract health workers from all over the world. Next slide, please. To uh, minimize the negative consequences of health worker migration in the source countries, the WHO Global Code of Practice was adopted in 2010 by the World Health Assembly. The objective was to establish uh, principles for ethical international recruitment and to advance international cooperation, especially focusing on the situation of developing countries. This is a voluntary instrument, but um, it has very strong uh, mechanisms for implementation reporting and reviews. Next slide, please. The WHO Health Workforce Support and Safeguards List identifies countries that are most vulnerable in terms of health workforce. There are 55 countries in the 2023 list uh, that host 19% of the world's population, 27% of the disease burden, but only 5% of the world's doctors, nurses, and midwives. In sharp contrast to the 10 countries that have almost a quarter of the health workforce, uh, but less than 10% of the population and disease burden. And there are reports of shortages in these countries. So WHO uh, advises countries to of the, the countries in the right um, to avoid targeted large-scale recruitments from countries uh, in this list, but instead uh, prioritize support for the education, employment, and retention of health workers in these countries so as to advance the right of health to the most vulnerable populations of the world. This does not mean that WHO advises um, uh, 
that uh, recruitment from these countries is banned. And that is absolutely not true. Health workers can work wherever they want to, as long as country laws allow them. These countries in the list often have a dual problem, one of need-based shortages, but another of being unable to employ them because of which there is a lot of um, unemployment of health workers as well. There may also be a shortage of one type of health workers, but a surplus of another. And at the global level, we compare doctors, nurses, and midwives, uh, but at the country level, there are other cadre of health workers who may be um, doing some of the works done by doctors, nurses, and midwives in other countries. So this sort of granular data is only available at the country level. Because of this, WHO advises recruitment from these countries through government to government agreements um, with meaningful participation of ministries of health. So the agreement strengthens health systems in both countries. Next slide, please. The forthcoming WHO guidance on bilateral agreements, which should be released um, next week or the week after, emphasizes recruitment through bilateral agreements should ensure health system strengthening to for countries of both origin and destination. Next slide, please. I'm giving you your one minute now. And uh, the next two years are pretty heavy on the migration agenda for us starting with uh, the release of the guidance and the fifth round of reporting uh, next month, which we invite all of you to participate. Next slide. So the key takeaway points is for all countries to invest in the education, employment, and retention of health workers to meet national needs as a complete package, to prioritize support for countries in the safeguards list and other low and middle income countries, and to ensure bilateral agreements are proportional benefits to both source and destination countries. We invite you all again to participate in the fifth round of reporting. There are separate instruments for member states, independent stakeholders, and private recruitment agencies. Next slide. Um, please contact us. And this is our uh, question to the audience. Next slide, please. How can you maximize benefits and minimize negative consequences of health worker migration in your country? I hope that was right on time. Thank you very much, um, Agya. Brilliant. Absolutely uh, right on time. And uh, such a lot of material there as well for us to consider. Um, I'll move on now to, um, who am I moving on to next? Howard. Howard, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Over to you. Uh, uh, Navina, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you to uh, NHS England. Thank you for WHO for um, hosting and organising what I think is an incredibly important uh, webinar on an issue which, yes, it's been around for many years, but I think that it's uh, it's of a significance of a scale um, uh, that we haven't seen before and needs to be absolutely at the top of um, the global health priority uh, agenda. Next slide please. The International Council of Nurses is uh, the body that represents nurses to um, uh, uh, global health organizations, including the WHO. We're headquartered in Geneva, our membership, our national nursing associations. We work with WHO to produce the first ever State of the World's Nursing Report uh, that you can see here, published in 2020. Uh, based on pre-pandemic data, it concluded that we had a global shortage of about 6 million nurses. And again, you can see here the, the point that Agia and Dr. Tedros have stressed, that we have uh, not just an, uh, too few nurses, we have a maldistribution around the world. And it is very significant from a, a tenfold different from those countries in blue who have 80, 90, 100 nurses per 10,000 population to those with um, 20 or less. The other uh, observation from this graph, if we think about the recruitment patterns that we're seeing now, the high income countries and a relatively small number of high income countries who are driving 70 to 80 percent of the recruitment activity that we're, we're seeing, um, those are you know, countries from North America, from Europe, from Aus, Aus, Australia. So our 
distribution and our inequality in uh, nurses per head of population uh, is inverse to um, the recruitment patterns that we are seeing. Next slide, please. As well as this issue of uh, maldistribution, we also have a uh, variation, significant variation in terms of production of uh, nurses, of new nurses. OECD data here shows you nursing graduates, um, latest data from 2021 across the OECD countries. Again, an enormous range from you know, around 10 uh, nurses being produced per 100,000 population to more than a hundred. Next slide, please. And of course, this is pre-COVID data, but we know that the pandemic had had an enormous effect on the global nursing workforce. Uh, this is just a series of briefings and papers that ICM produced during the course of the pandemic, highlighted the enormous psychological and mental health impacts that nurses were facing, evidence of nurses leaving the profession early as a result of that through burnout. We saw changes, uh, disruption to education, uh, very high rates initially of infections amongst healthcare workers. Work with WHO, we estimate, as a minimum 150,000 deaths around the world. Hugely slow pace in terms of getting vaccines to people. We've seen strikes and disputes as well. So we have this COVID effect. Next slide, please. Put all of that together. We started with a 6 million shortage. We know from the same data that there are nearly 5 million nurses due to retire over the next five years. The COVID effect, we've done some modeling and looked at the fact that there could be two to 3 million nurses who exit earlier than they otherwise otherwise would have done that. So that pushes us up to a, a replacement need of 12 or 13 million. Um, and we have a global population of 28 million. Um, but this final slide uh, that you can see, you follow the arrows around to the 30 million. I think this is also just important to highlight. This is work from the University of Washington in Seattle, who took a more ambitious view of the global ambition to ensure universal healthcare coverage for everybody. And they said, look, if we really want to push up to, you know, 80 percent or so of countries achieving universal health care coverage for nurses, we actually need to be looking about 70 nurses per 10,000 population. And that would give us a need of 30 million. Next slide, please. Uh, we can then see um, uh, this is based on OEC data. So I think of this, although uh, almost as an, an indicator of countries' self-sufficiency currently, or self-sufficiency in terms of homegrown, home-produced nurses, uh, or reliance on nurses from overseas. It's the share of foreign trained nurses in 2021 across the OECD countries. Again, you can see a huge variation. The midpoint is at 8.7. That's gone up from 5% five, um, 5 in twenty. 10, which points to why I say, yes, we've had this for a long time, but we haven't seen the scale of the increase um, a, a previous, uh, previously. If we look at this and think of it in terms of a self-sufficiency indicator, it's not happened by accident. These are deliberate policy choices that have been made about how many nurses we train domestically versus what the reliance would be on overseas. I also think that if I listen to debates in other sectors like food, energy, national security, they would think about this as, and they would describe it as a food security issue, an energy security, a national security issue. I don't think that we perhaps even have the language to recognize that the supply of healthcare workers and nurses should be considered as important as a national security issue. I think it's a risk and unsustainable to rely on this level of recruitment from over, overseas in the medium to long term. Next slide, please. This just gives you an idea of some of the numbers. This is back from 2022 said big numbers from a small number of uh, high income countries who are driving this, but it's on the increase in France, in Switzerland, Finland, Canada, places we haven't seen such big numbers before. Just yesterday, we were I was approached by media from Denmark because their health minister is on his way to India to strike a deal um, with uh, with the Indian government's supply of nurses, health workers for Denmark. That also points to the fact that this market is becoming more competitive, which raises a significant sustainability question. The countries that are experiencing outflow, 
India and Philippines, interesting in terms of historically being considered uh, as uh, suppliers of nurses to the world. I think there's a cautionary note here for me. Uh, just over a year ago, the Philippines announced that it had its own nursing shortage of about 350,000. India has ramped up production of nurses, but also has ambitions to improve uh, universal health coverage in its country. And we've heard about government to government agreements being a way in which countries um, can still legitimately recruit from those that are on the WHO safeguarding list or red list, Nepal and Ghana being one. But I want to, next slide please, I want to just raise some caution about government to government uh, agreements. When I last looked at Ghana and Nepal, uh, they had about 20 or 30 nurses per head of population population, only a pool of about 70,000 nurses. So any loss from those countries is going to have an impact. And this is what we've been hearing really loudly through our associations for the last few months now. And this is just an example of reports from Ghana covered by the BBC just recently. These are people on the ground in Ghana who talk about the impact of international recruitment. Care is affected. We're not able to take any more patients. There are delays. It costs more in mortality. Patients die, says a senior nurse. A senior doctor says the effects are enormous. Immunisation of children, loss of public health nurses, babies not immunised. These are some of the risks. Uh, and another nurse who talks about our critical care nurses, our experienced nurses have gone. We have nothing, no experienced nurses to work with. We have to go through the pain of training nurses. This is an important issue. It's not just new nurses who are being targeted for recruitment. It's experienced nurses. Um, and this is just an example of the very real health harms and impacts on the health systems of countries that are already weak and vulnerable. And of course, if they lose their nurses, they've then got to pay uh, to educate more nurses, um, but are they being compensated fairly, appropriately, proportionately in a mutual way for the nurses they're losing? Next slide, please. One minute, Howard. Um, I've got this one and one more, and I will do those in one minute. Here are some policy questions that arise for us as a result of all of this. I've made the think about these are a result of planning choices. There are serious ethical issues. Have we really got good data on mutuality of benefits? We hear a lot about sharing and learning. That's not the same as paying for the education of nurses that you have lost because you've recruited or building new nursing schools and faculty. Are our government to government agreements um, are they OK in the current context still? Should Even if there is a government to government agreement, should we be recruiting from countries, actively recruiting from countries we have limited um, which have limited uh, resources. We have a WHO code, who determines compliance? How do we know? How do we define and describe uh, what is mutual um, benefit? And we've also had some dreadful examples of exploitative employment practice recruitment practices. We do not think that the global code of practice is working effectively at the moment and it needs to be strengthened. And my final slide, is taken from the UN political declaration of um, at the high level meeting in New York last September. So this is a big deal because it's a UN General Assembly uh, declaration. And just note the language in here that the UN expresses deep concern at this global shortage, the impact on low and middle income countries, the acceleration, the need to strengthen the WHO code of practice. What is happening? What are we doing to, to strengthen that code? And to ensure that bilateral agreements, they don't just exist, but that they are proportional benefits for both countries of origin. So ensuring proportional benefits uh, and strengthening the code, a very clear signal from, w, uh, from the U. N. And my question uh, was very similar to Aggie's. Uh, what should ethical recruitment look like in practice? Naveena, back to you. Thank you so much, Howard. Again, packed full of um, thought provoking information there. I'll move on to Jed now, please, Jed. Good morning, all, and many thanks for the uh, invitation to address you all this morning. And I'm going to come from this from a, a completely different tack, other than to acknowledge the fact that um, uh, my own background uh, from a healthcare professional perspective is in uh, a health economy which has 
been responsible for some of that 25% that Ted Ross referred to uh, initially. And I've used a quote here, uh, which was um, uh, said by uh, my friend and colleague Francis Amazwa from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa from Uganda uh, at the uh, Fifth Global Forum, Forum on Human Resources for Health uh, last year in Geneva, which is, is it time for uh, the, uh, the Western UHCs to pay the transfer fees? Uh, next, next slide. Before I do that, however, I'm going to go right back to basics and uh, look at uh, uh, good and bad drivers for uh, migration. Um, I'm, a, I'm a surgical educationalist at heart, and uh, as a surgical educationalist, I know that there are three primary influ influences in how people learn. Uh, the first of these is what we learn, the curriculum. Uh, the second is who we learn it from. Uh, how we are role modeled. And the third and perhaps the single most important influence on the way in which we practice is our learning environment and our clinical learning environments. And those of us who are health professionals recognize that uh, our, our learning is lifelong and it uh, exists because of the interaction that we have with our, with our patients. One of the things that um, uh, my own unit, the Global Health Unit in NHS has realized over the last five or six years since it came into ex existence is that when healthcare um, workforce move into uh, um, uh, environments that are alien to themselves, um, and particularly in uh, other health economies, then their rate of learning increases. And not only does their rate of learning increase, but also the type of learning increases from one which is very competence-based, learning about things and how to do things, into things that are, into one that is very meta-skill-based. Uh, around uh, improving things such as emotional intelligence, leadership, cultural competence, communication, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. So we know that there are types of migration uh, which are learner-focused, uh, which actually are positive because they improve productivity of workforces. Uh, they improve uh, uh, retention, reduce attrition. They um, allow uh, individual healthcare workers to rapidly acquire meta skills. And perhaps more importantly, uh, with uh, Gen Z and the millennials, uh, we know that um, uh, migration, particularly on a temporary basis, is increasingly in demand. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, my own uh, uh, health units has recognized for some period of time that we need to think differently about the way in which international recruitment is uh, is managed across the world, particularly amongst Western universal health coverage systems. We recognize, and COVID has illustrated this, that throwing uh, finance uh, entirely at the demand side uh, without looking at um, uh, the supply side and the impact that it has on supply countries is both unethical but also non-sustainable. And so... Um, we have created an ethical migratory pathway team, uh, which is working with um, the NHS, professional bodies and overseas partners to design, pilot and evaluate and disseminate a range of novel pathways with a strong ethical focus to allow overseas educated health professionals to spend time working, earning and learning in the National Health Service. Next slide, please. Uh, to date, we've developed uh, these following ethical migratory pathways here. I'm going to come on to some more detail uh, on those in a minute. Um, but uh, each of them are predicated fundamentally on the uh, the outline um, re uh, or compliance, if you like, uh, with the bilateral agreement guidelines of the World Health Organization, which I've been privileged to, um, uh, to learn about as I've uh, grown into this subject over the course of the last three or four years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have been on a journey, really. Uh, this probably was the first part of the journey where we attempted to look at end-to-end -end international recruitment of nurses. And I spoke to, to Howard about this uh, uh, earlier uh, last year. And what we attempted to do was to analyse the learning journey from expression of interest into uh, uh, placement and delivery of healthcare in uh, the uh, UK NHS and looked at um, the, the barriers, uh, both the barriers for that uh, recruitment, but also uh, the issues that led to uh, a poor recruitment practice, uh, poor um, engagements within uh, host uh, countries, uh, and, poor, and um, 
a poor quality of experience, really, for uh, individuals who had taken the brave step of wishing uh, to uh, work and learn in another country. Uh, this program uh, ran from 2018 to 2021. Uh, it was an end-to-end -end, uh, program and gave us a huge amount of learning which we researched, but because uh, we felt that uh, there wasn't mutuality or sufficient mutuality in this journey. Uh, we finished this programme uh, early in 2021 and looked at other ways of improving the ethical side of, of migration. Next slide, please. So our eth ethical migratory pathway uh, team fundamentally looks at uh, three elements of, um, of migration. First of all, uh, on the demand side, so that we fully understand what the demand is from uh, our own uh, system. Uh, we look and develop close relationships, not just at G2G level, but also institution to institution, peer to peer uh, and place based uh, partnerships with our supply side. And perhaps most importantly, we focusing or increasingly focusing our migratory pathways on the individual uh, person themselves, uh, who uh, obviously this affects more than than uh, anybody else. And in the same way that we have uh, become value based and patient led uh, within our healthcare delivery, we are wanting to become increasingly more uh, migrants uh, uh, focused, recognize, recognizing the expertise uh, and uh, value which migrants bring to our system. Next uh, slide, please. Just a couple of examples. This is uh, an example that we have um, with uh, the Middle East at the moment, uh, which is an earn, learn, and return uh, scheme, which is uh, on a, done on a cost recovery basis with Saudi Arabia uh, and the Middle East for trading postgraduate uh, doctors. Next slide, please. Uh, we also now have a series of... Um, uh, NHS uh, relationships under MOUs and direct SLAs with a series of uh, Indian state governments. Uh, this is allowing um, uh, annualised workforce planning uh, between um, uh, our institutions and local accountable care organisations uh, and the supply chain to ensure that uh, there is proactive discussion of, of mutuality and mutual benefit. Next slide, please. Um, a, a very a uh, straightforward example of this would be a relationship that exists at the moment between uh, Leeds Teaching Hospitals, one of our big trusts in the north uh, east of England, and the governments of St Vincent's and the Grenadines, which began in 2018. This has seen uh, the mutual uh, exchange of uh, information, of knowledge, uh, and of human beings and systems, uh, system knowledge over the course of the last five years, and is dynamic and determined by annualized uh, workforce um, and uh, activity planning cycles. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a quote from the uh, the Prime Minister of St Vincent's and the Grenadines, which I think uh, reinforces what Tedros had to say earlier. In an epoch of climate change, where there are so many new health challenges, one of the best ways to ensure appropriate response on behalf of your people is to build efficacious partnership with institutions like the NHS. Next slide, please. So our lessons really to summarize are that migration can be either good or bad, dependent on the context. Uh, particularly can be very valuable when focused on the migrant themselves and on their educational and lifelong learning development. A partnership for mutual benefit, and we can discuss this later, what we mean by this, creates a framework for ethical migration. And uh, diaspora integration into healthcare systems uh, through cultural uh, intelligence not only improves retention, but unleashes the ability of those migrants to transform healthcare systems uh, in, in uh, the uh, place, of, uh, place of work. But none of this can be done without us continuing to evaluate the impact uh, that this has on uh, governments, on places, on institutions and on people. And we continue to maintain um, uh, an investment into that evaluation uh, in our own unit. So my question, Navina, is what can be done to encourage established universal health coverage systems to collaborate to reduce the negative impacts of international recruitment uh, on uh, the, the countries identified by, uh, by Howard and Tedros? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jed, uh, for giving us that NHS co uh, context. Um, I'll move on now to Maggie. Maggie, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start by thanking um, the WHO and Health Education England 
for inviting me to be part of this uh, Working for Health uh, 2030 seminar on international migration of healthcare workers. Um, I think for me, this is an um, opportune time, especially as a country wherein we are preparing for universal health coverage. And we know that for us to be able to implement universal health coverage, we need to have adequate human resources, which is actually adequately distributed. Next slide. So my presentation outline is very clear. It's actually focusing on the concept of health workforce migration, the number of medical doctors and nurses in line with OECD in 2020, and also the consequences of healthcare workforce migration. And also I'm also going to reflect on the strategies that we can actually adopt to address health workforce migration and then conclusion. Next slide. So in this slide, actually, what I'm trying to talk to also, which has been addressed by the previous speakers and also by the Director General of the World Health Organization is the issue about um, the movement of skilled healthcare personnel or persons which is actually, if you look at it, you've got the source country, where in the source country is where these people are coming from. And um, I think it has also been covered by one of, uh, or, two, or some of the presenters, that the main issue which is actually fueling these is driven by fundamental labor market forces. And also there's a growing demand for skilled yeah. health workforce, particularly in developed countries. This has been going on over the years. If you look at the uh, slide or the picture on the side, the graph, you can see that this has been, actually it's a graph which has been tracking migration of healthcare workforce from uh, 1850 until 2015. And you can see there was a time when it was high and it went down um, between 1910 until 1970 yeah. and it has up since the 70s. So this is also a serious challenge for us, particularly the source countries. So this movement is also considered a, a crisis in the health sector, uh, in the source countries, because these pathways, they contribute to some, they might say there's positive and also there's negative outcomes, but it depends on how you look at it. When you look at the positive outcomes of uh, health workforce migration is that there are people who are gaining new skills. I think some of my colleagues also indicated were presenting earlier then, but also some countries, they even go to an extent of getting some remittances or getting reparations or money back for, for from training. But also on the other side, you will find that those who are receiving on the receiving end, they've got improved quality of life. And also there's opportunity for education for some of these migrant, um, skilled migrant workers, and also they improve livelihood. But I think what is more of a challenge for the source countries now is the negative um, uh, consequences. If you look at this, but uh, brain drain, uh, where you find that this skilled workforce that have left these uh, source yeah. countries can be and quickly um, be recruited or be replaced. And um, we remain actually with weak health systems. And by then actually we end up actually with the financial loss that actually we have encountered when we were also trying to train these health workforces. But also, on the flip side, there's an issue of culture shock for some of this. So it has been recorded in um, in literature, and also some of the uh, of them, uh, you know, different um, skilled migrant workers. They also um, experience some kind of discrimination. So then, then there's also an issue of gender imbalance. This actually will affect where they are going. Mostly you find that males are the ones who are more 
um, quicker and find it easier to move to other countries. Therefore, it means that they remain, females remain at home mending um, and looking after the children. But also we've got pressure on the services on where actually, where this um, uh, skilled workforce are going to. So there's win and uh, win and win and also their losses. Next slide. So this is um, a graph which is showing um, the number of medical doctors and nurses. Um, this data actually uh, dates back in 2020, where we are actually looking at countries as indicated in the bar graph, where you've got most doctors on the right. Um, for instance, if you look at Norway, they've got almost, um, you know, they've got um, 10 doctors Per, 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 per thousand uh, population. And then you look at, um, you know, our countries like us in South Africa, where we are actually even struggling. We are trying to be at the level of having two doctors um, per thousand, and we are still struggling. So we, if you look at um, the, the blue color being the color for doctors, you would see that it's very low. But um, you know, when it comes to nurses also, we are still low. Then the, the irony of this is that, as you can see, globally 40% of WHO member states have got fewer than 10 medical doctors per 10,000. However, the African region shoulders 22% of the global burden of disease, but has access to almost or only 3% of health workers. And these, with this 3% that we have in the African region, those which have got more, they are still actually getting from those who have got less. Next slide. So what is it that I would like us to reflect on? You can see uh, there's an image that I have on the slide, on the side where I'm showing international migration and somebody is showing a green card you know, so we, we, you know, in 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 most cases, you find that um, you know, like we, we have already indicated that people wants to move for better life, and also they want to improve their livelihood. But on the flip side, or also the challenge that we have is that um, you know we need to actually have public health interventions which address challenges in the context of health workforce mobility particularly in countries like us in Africa or in the African region. It is important to identify and prioritize public health measures that need to be strengthened. For instance, um, in South Africa for a number of years now, we have had um, retention policies that we have been implementing to ensure that our health workforce stay in the country. However, we have also realized recently that there's a need also to review some of these retention uh, uh, workforce policies. Then we also um, also look at it to say we need to build a global capacity for training health workforce. I think some of the presenters also talked about it, that um, they are also involved in training um, health workforce uh, globally. And also there's also need to increase recruitment and retention of health workers and to manage the movement of health workers. Um, because we know that most of them, they move on their own account. But at the end of the day is that how do we ensure that this movement is managed so that the country that actually is the source country does not remain wanting and having a um, weak health system. So there's also a need to understand health workforce migration, that is the economic, social, political, cultural, and environmental. And then my colleagues also talked about the push and pull factors, but also our policies should be targeted in addressing this. And we should promote employment opportunities and reduce drivers for forced migration. So in conclusion, next slide. Uh, managing workforce, health workforce migration is critical in order to minimize the negative consequences uh, in both us and the host countries, although we know that the, the source countries, they bear the, the, the biggest brunt. Uh, countries that receive foreign trained workers should establish bilateral agreements with 
that this has been actually going on, but actually the enforcement of it, uh, although discussions have been ratified at the WHO meetings at higher level, it has not been forthcoming. So it is important for us to really look into that so that any exchange or any recruitment is done in an ethical way. I think this was emphasized by um, the WHO Director General. We also need to improve the governance of international health workers, uh, health worker migration. That is um, the global code, which actually my colleague also um, mentioned it earlier. But the issue here is that this global code talks to actually reporting on who actually is leaving the country, who is coming into the country. And we have not really been um, you know, effective in using that. So for me, I think it will... May I ask you to wind up now, please? Thank you. Thank you. So I think for us to be able to be on the winning side, it will be good for us to implement the code which seeks to minimize the negative consequences of health worker migration and promote workforce sustainability. Last slide. So the last slide is the question wherein I'm asking what should be done to address the critical shortage of health workforce from the source countries, the source countries being the countries that I gave an example of wherein these, um, workforce um, um, they are actually being recruited from or they originate from? That is the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie, and uh, really bringing to life the impact um, of this work in, 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 in across the world, but particularly in source countries, as you described. Finally, um, not... Uh, is, is my colleague here, Padam. Uh, may I hand over to you to round up the panel discussions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for WHO and NHS England for giving this opportunity to share this, this uh, my experience on this field. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my presentation is slightly different than the previous uh, speaker. So I want to highlight the Nepal as, as a case study and looking at the migration in general and how that impacted the health worker production in the first place. And also the, the I want to highlight some of the health issues of Nepalese migrant worker currently facing in other country and that indicate what type of skill that we need to produce for our health worker and what type of problem these people are facing. So these days the people are trained in one country providing the service in other country and so what type of health skill they need and I want to bring a few examples of the health worker migration from Nepal. Next slide please. So as you know, the Nepal has a long history of migration uh, in, in the post World War, Second World War, uh, in, in Second World War. I mean, so there's a out of 200, uh, six, uh, sorry, 6 million population, 131,000 uh, the engaged to Gorkha soldier. Recently in the 2021 census, Nepal has about 29 million population. And then the best guess is estimated that about 7 million Nepalese are currently working outside the country nearly 20% of the whole country population. So it's a, such a significant number. Uh, and, and then they are the labor worker, student, and other health workers. So next slide, please. So uh, this is the, just the between uh, 2008 and 2021, 22, more than 4.7 million new labor approval were issued for Nepalese migrant wanting to work abroad. Means that they, these people went to the other country to work. Many of them are still working. Next slide, please. Uh, so you can see that pattern. There is a slightly decline during the COVID time, and but the, there is a last year, uh, around 700 um, the people went to the other country for work. Uh, so this is a quite big number. And the next one, please. So the, the major destination for Nepalese migrant worker are Malaysia, that's number one, and, and then India, Saudi, Qatar, uh, and, and the, basically the Middle East. These are the major destination for labor migrant worker. Next one, please. So this one, and, and then it's a quite important for Nepal economic, what happened in Malaysia or what happened in Qatar has a direct impact in, in the Nepal economic. So the depend on the what type of source you use, according to World Bank, 23% of the Nepal's GDP based on the 
money sent by migrant workers. So sending the people in other country or the money getting from the other country is a quite significant for Nepal economy in compared to the other country is way uh, high in term of the contribution of remittance on GDP. Last year, the about 1.1 trillion Nepalese rupees was, uh, uh, was collected through the remittance. And this is the major source of income for the, for the country. So next one, please. So the other form of migration, that's, that's the important point here that I want to highlight how that impacted on the health worker training in Nepal. Last year, around 230,000 student young people completed the A level or 10 plus 2 level who are eligible to go for university. Out of them, 140 obtained the no objection certificate means they want to go to the, so if you want to go to the other country, you need to get that no objection certificate from Ministry of uh, Education in Nepal. And half of those students are willing, are ready to go. According to UNESCO data, the year before in 2022, around 95 students were studying in other country. Among them, Australia is, is the most popular one. Nearly half of them go there, Japan, India, USA, and, and many parts of the world. Uh, the last year, I mean, very recently, the, if you look at the, the Australian data, about 53,000 Nepalese students enroll in Australian higher education, which is the 7% of the, all the international students that Australia has. And Nepal is the third largest country to supply the international students in Australia after the India and China. So, so that has the severe consequences on the health worker training in the home country. Because of the number of changes, uh, the policy changes in Nepal, around 53 nursing colleges is now shut down. Uh, partly because there is a new regulation in terms of requirement, partly because there are very few students who want to study in the country. So this has the serious impact in terms of the health worker, uh, the production and, and the supply side. The next one, please. So, uh, so the other aspect is that apart from labor worker, and, and also the student, there are other form of migration, people go there. And a common route for Nepalese health worker going to the other country is go through the student and, and, and then enroll in the different program. And if you look at the OECD data, just in US, just highlight the problem, is that from in the last 20 years, about 1,500 Nepalese doctor migrated to the US. In Nepal, there is about 27 registered doc, 27,000 registered doctor uh, in Nepal. And, and the 1,500, 5% of those are in US. So the same in UK and other part of the world. This is just the one example. And there are many in the Middle East as well. Next one, please. So if you look those figures, and then the, the, as I mentioned, 7 million Nepalese where they are, and, and they are, I mean, the, everywhere in the world. And, and basically there's high concentration in Middle East. Uh, you can see it's a half million in Qatar, similar number in UAE and, and other part of the, and, and Saudi Arabia and other country. Uh, next one, please. So, uh, so and, and then we, we are, our team is also looking at some of the issues of the, the health problem of this migrant worker. And, and then it's quite important that what type of training we provide our health worker to deal with this problem. And this is just the highlight. I just want to bring the one or two example of the Nepalese migrant worker working in the Middle East and Malaysia and, and some of the health problem uh, they face uh, in, in those countries, just to highlight some example. Next one is, uh, please. So there's one study looking at the, the heat, heat stress impact on cardiac mortality among Nepalese migrant worker working in Qatar. And if you look at this, the, this, the, the, the problem, uh, around 50% of the death in age between 25 to 35 years due to CVD cause. However, if you look at those deaths among Nepalese migrant worker, it's a 22% during cool season and 58% during the hot season. Uh, next one, please. So what that indicate is that the the, even if you look the if you reduce the two degree uh, temperature in working environment, you could prevent half of those deaths. And and the similarly and and the, the next one please. So if you look this all these the the other other uh, study that we look we recently review the the health issues of Nepalese migrant worker and we did the systematic review, and what we found next one please is that the. Uh, the, so out of three high quality study, the 12 were conducted in Qatar and few in Malaysia, Nepal and other countries. And then major health issues of this worker are mental health, 
occupational health, sexual health, healthcare access, and infectious disease. So uh, these, these are the, some of the challenges. Just to pick up the mental health, the next one, please. Uh, so the, there's a five-year study look at the mental health issues of this worker. Uh, and, and then prevalence of mental health problem, there's a big definition of mental health, is, is from 8% to the 23%. So it's a, such a serious issues. And as we know that if we provide the simple health intervention, this could be, many of those could be prevented. The next one, please. So by looking the, the, the other study, we also look the cause of those problem uh, among this Nepalese migrant worker. And what we found, next one, please, is that the, the next slide, please. Is, is that there are two factors, the individual factor and structural factor that impacted those health problem among these Nepalese worker. Next one, please. So, uh, and then by looking this one, and we also look the cause of death among Nepalese migrant worker. I want to bring the cause of death among migrant worker alone who died in Middle East and Malaysia. Uh, and the, the, there's a precaution that the data quality of those death record is poor and, and it's uh, difficult to verify. However, next one, please. So if you look in the last uh, 12 years from 2008-9 to 21-22, according to the uh, Nepal government report uh, recently published, 10,000 Nepalese were died in those countries. On the record system, as I mentioned, there is a limitation. They have just the six calls, and the, after the COVID, there's a seven calls. Uh, and, and then the, there is a huge number of death is uh, preventable. And in and, and many cases, uh, the, um, the, and then the one of the issues, just highlight the next one, please. If you just to highlight this, uh, uh, next one, please. Yeah, you can see that. I mean, I, I just want to bring the mental health issues. About 11% of the death is due to suicide. And this is quite various as well. So if you look at 17, 18, about 16% of death is, is due to the suicide. And the global literature suggests that if you uh, have a basic the counseling service in the first place, half of those deaths could be prevented. So it is a uh, it, it is a major issue. So next one, please. So the other issues that I want to highlight here is the cause of death in the uh, the just highlight. If you look the cause of death in Qatar, cardiac arrest is the major cause. But if you look the cause of death in in the the um, Saudi Arabia and and that's the road traffic accident is, is the one of the major cause in 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 the Saudi Arabia and then the lot of the literature suggests that if we have a proper counseling pre departure training of those workers and half of those could be prevented so and and then the 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 health issues these migrant workers are facing and the challenge that we have is is a quite significant next one please so uh, in, in conclusion, and um, so the migration has empowered the Nepalese migrant worker to become financially and socially independent, but it has a huge cost. And, and then coming back to the health worker migration, in one level, uh, there is a limited health worker already in the place in Nepal. In other level, there is not many people are now joining to the health training. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the, it's partly because there's a large number of students are leaving the country for the further study in other country. And, and there's a, the, largely there is a different regulation changes on the health and medical education in Nepal. So addressing the migration issues, particularly health worker migration issues required, I think it's a comprehensive approach involving not only the health sector, but also considering the economic, social, and educational factor to create the well-rounded strategies. Then only we can, uh, we can address uh, those, uh, those problems. So that my final- But one question, minute now. Oh, yeah, final that's minute. the final question <laughs> is, is the next one is the final question is, how can Nepal make a balance between its economic resilience and remittance as I mentioned, the 23 to 30% of 
country income is based on remittance and, and the migration is the main source of income and, and then potential demographic challenges arising from the significant outflow of working age population. So how the Nepal can tackle this one? Because if you go to the village area, rural area, there's hardly either elderly or children, no young people on the village. So how Nepal can make this balance with that note? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Padam. Um, again, from bringing the perspective from Nepal, and I was particularly interested in the angle of from young people and students and learners as well. Um, and that's a really important thing for us not to forget because they are our future global health uh, and care workforce. Um, fantastic five uh, brilliant presentations there. So much to think about and talk about. Um, and thank you all for keeping within time. Uh, you're hard to interrupt, can I say? Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm going to start now by giving you 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 pose some questions to um, our participants uh, in this seminar, and we've got some thoughts from them. I'm going to just pick some and share them with you, uh, panel, and maybe ask for your reflections. Um, Agia and Howard, your your questions were really about uh, about really um, ethical recruitment and how can we maximize benefits, but also minimize negative consequences? Um, and uh, I'm gonna just, just share with you some of the thoughts that people have had in this space. Um, and then I will uh, open up for the panel to discuss, and then I'll come to the other uh, uh, presentations next. So in, the quest in this question about how do we actually make this work well for everybody, um, here are a couple of, um, of uh, considerations. So, um, do we look at uh, really seriously how we how we make it how we standardize or formalize this option the opportunity to learn and take back skills we talk about it quite a lot uh, how do we make that a reality take back skills knowledge and experience to their home country um, are there research policy and healthcare strategies that can help. The other, which I think is really important, is international workers need to keep in touch with their countries of origin. Um, and this is, this is a beautiful um, sentiment here about uplifting the health system. Um, so that's something that I think uh, I, I resonated for me. Um, and then um, something else which I think we have to uh, acknowledge is um, support, uh, pre and post departure support, welfare, encouraging skills development uh, so that this is really a growth uh, opportunity for people as they move around the world. And also, how do you promote return migration? Is that something we should be thinking about? And then this one uh, we have to acknowledge and um, uh, it's the elephant in the room, which is about the discrimination and racism that international workers uh, and colleagues face wherever they go around the world. Um, and it's, 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 it's not, it's sadly, everybody has to own this. Um, so those are some of the points that have been raised. Um, can I get some reflections? Oh, one more, the COVID effect on nursing. People, any thoughts about the COVID effect, please, as well. Right, my panel colleagues, who would like to go first on those reflections? Um, Agia, I saw you put your hand up, so. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, I think I didn't emphasize this enough in my presentation, but um, WHO promotes um, equal treatment of health workers, regardless of where they come from or where they were trained in. And um, in fact, over time, when we look uh, according to what we have been reported in the code implementation, elements on this have improved over time. It may still not be perfect in some parts of the world, in others it has improved. The same with orderly mobility and rights, at least uh, for the career, career options and remuneration of um, health workers, migrants is um, uh, comparable or equal to uh, what the nationals are getting. Um, from our records or the information that we have, this component is increasing over time. What uh, we don't have enough data on is um, the code recommends, uh, you know, ethical international recruitment in a way that uh, benefits health workers. 
as well as health systems in both uh, countries of destination and origin. So there are three parts to this. Uh, we have not found any evidence of health systems in source countries being benefited, despite the increasing migration, uh, irrespective of the route, and whether it's through uh, the agreements as well. That's one part. And um, we also, uh, the code also emphasizes on promoting circular migration, but we do not have enough data on this. Uh, and the only evidence we have on circular migration is when the reason for migration is uh, solely education. And so often it is tied to the diploma being released after um, they come back. Uh, otherwise, especially when it is for employment and when the wage differentials are high, circular migration is um, the, in the evidence that we have is mostly anecdotal. And also uh, there is problems on um, regulations and recognition of their international uh, qualification and experience. In some cases, it may be because there are wide differences on the job that they did in the foreign country and the qualifications they achieved versus the needs in the uh, source countries. So there may be a mismatch there, but uh, sometimes it's also because there, the regulatory uh, um, requirements for the workers in the source countries are very rigid, that there is no option to re-enter the uh, labor market because of these requirements. So just wanted to highlight this. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, that. Uh, again, a little bit more detail for us to 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 understand. Howard, did you you had your hand up too? Yes, thanks, uh, Navina. I, I agree with um, with what Agio said. If I if I go back to first base on this, we do not have a, enough nurses, health workers global globally. We have a growing gap between demand and supply. And there is there is for me something about if I if I listen to the debates that are happening at the moment about global security. There's a big debate about it should be 2% of GDP that's being spent on security, uh, security. You know, I think we need that sort of debate about what our expectations are around GDP spend on health worker education. And that should be tied to the planning assumptions that people are making. Is it OK to make a planning assumption where you are reliant 10, 20, 30 percent on recruiting from overseas in this global context that we've talked with that, that we've talked about. So there's something there about planning and increasing the global supply, which is down to all countries. When I then come to the issue of well, how do we ensure ethical recruitment? I thought and talked thought about this a lot and talked to our associations an awful lot as well. Uh, and I'm afraid, well, I'm not afraid, I am drawn back to now this really is a money question as well i mean what does it cost to educate a nurse in in in, in the uk I, I don't know 50 60 70 thousand if you then think well that's actually it's, it's a, a specialist nurse and intensive care nurse you know this is running into hundreds of hun hundreds of thousands and that's a, a loss to the countries who are losing their nurses so i think that we need to see we need to see the global debate you know, the UN have said we need to strengthen the code. And I think part of that strengthening, if it doesn't involve a discussion about money, um, then um, I don't think that we're going far enough. And I think the current issues will perpetuate. Now, that doesn't I mean, there are a number of ways you can do that it could be country to country. I mean, the irony is that the countries at the forefront of lead of, of recruitment also have world renowned and recognized health education systems, you guys being one of them. So. Is it country to country? It, could there be a global agreement between six or seven of those high OECD countries? Could WHO or another international organization play a role in terms of managing a global health education fund that people then contribute to proportionate to the amount of recruitment and the cost of recruitment? And then to use that not as a free gift to the countries that are losing their nurses because we've heard we've got unemployment problem we've got nurses who are unemployed in some countries and countries who say we can't afford to employ them if but if there is going to be compensation to you look at how financial incentives could be used to also require match funding or increase in funding from those countries as as well so i think it the strengthening bit has to include money the final point on this let's not forget the nurses that everybody currently has something that I was hugely frustrated about um, 
as the pandemic came to an end, not only did we see this increase in international recruitment, we saw an increase around the world in strikes and disputes. And we saw some countries yes. deliberately sitting back and holding off and not actively engaged. Are we doing, yes. are countries doing as much as they can to value, to support, to retain their current workforce? Back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Yes. So there's a really strong push there for the different ways in which we can value and support and, uh, and, 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 and as you said, you said retain, but actually I think also think about this retention in a, in a global sense across the world in partnership. Right. Now, before I come to both Jed, Mag Maggie and Padam, I'd like your views as well. I'm just going to pick the three, three themes that came out of the other uh, questions that you raise so that we can wrap them all up before we go to open questions uh, from the floor. Um, so on the point that you, uh, your question that you asked of our, of our participants, Jed, I'm going to pick one, um, which is about um, holding countries accountable. I think this is a really interesting one. What, what, what power, what do we have to hold countries accountable collectively? Those of us in this room, we're all speaking to the converted here. So that's one thing. The second, from your perspective, Maggie, um, and yours, um, uh, Padam, I think there's a strong theme about how do we make working conditions and compensation, not just sal not just financial, but but in other ways as well, status and uh, uh, and opportunities um, better for people in the source countries. Uh, and what responsibly do we have globally to make that happen so that actually it is more sustainable right across the world? Um, so those that's something that I think um, came up from both Maggie yours and Padam yours, uh, your your presentation. So I'm opening it up now. I will go to Jed, I think you had your hand up first and then Maggie and um, Padam, if you would like to uh, at the end, Jed. Thank, thank you, Naveen. I'll, I'll try and be brief on this. Well, first of all, um, despite uh, my presentation, I find it very difficult to disagree with uh, with Aggie and Howard for the majority of what they say. But um, I think I think we're very much at the early stage of understanding what mutuality means and more importantly, how to impact it. However, I do see some green shoots in this. And the things I think that we've learned, I can give you some real examples and some data, Aggie, if you want on this, but only on a relatively small scale. So the first thing to say, uh, uh, to say is that any mutuality needs to be pre-agreed and under a joint vision so that what you, you need without any question is an early conversation with a supply <coughs> or, or with the supply side countries asking what it is that they want because there is a, 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 a colonization or a decolonization uh, issue that needs to go on in these conversations, which is utterly essential, uh, because the reality is that, that our perception as, as established UHCs of what uh, developing um, uh, healthcare systems want uh, is colonized and almost invariably wrong. So there is an element of us uh, uh, systematizing uh, conversations on a regular and dynamic base, basis with partners in order to understand mutuality. And I can give some really clear examples of that, particularly in the Caribbean. And more recently, for example, uh, we are having um, preemptive conversations based on uh, workforce planning tools that we're using in the UK uh, with the Carolyn government looking at mutual benefits uh, before we, we do any activity at all. So I think that that's really important. And then the second point is um, we need to empower diaspora. Uh, in this, but we, we've got a, a a group of individuals, a growing group of individuals whose understanding and learning is predicated on working within two healthcare environments. What we actually do, uh, ironically, and Navina has hit it, is we discriminate against diaspora, uh, which is uh, I mean, it's almost an, uh, a sort of bizarre that we do that because we really are shooting the messenger. And I think so there's an element about formalization of diaspora engagements in mutual health system strengthening that I think we're learning about now. One final point, uh, I agree about the money. Um, but there are some really big steps that need to happen in this. So uh, all of us have been, all of us on this panel have been in debates, probably some of us for many years, uh, about uh, Western economies investing in healthcare education within low, middle and emerging economies. 
we see so little of it uh, uh, at the moment. So there are some policy decisions. Uh, if we're going to really genuinely uh, develop globally accredited healthcare workforce, not just nurses, by the way, but across the board, globally accredited healthcare workforce. It's uh, absolutely essential uh, that the uh, the established Western economies work together in order to demonstrate um, uh, the investment in low and middle and emerging economies. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, Jed. Maggie, may I bring you in now? Thank you. Uh, and I also would like to thank the people who are in attendance uh, for the questions that they've raised. Uh, they are very important questions. And uh, these are the questions which are um, key in or which are at the center of health workforce migration. Uh, one of it, which is also, um, which has been mentioned also by the panelists is the issue about um, good working conditions and also the issues of um, good compensation. Um, but also on the other hand, on the flip side, where we said um, the WHO code can assist us. I think it also, it is important for us to consider the issues of transparency on who is actually leaving the country and who is going in another country and how much of it is it. Um, and um, talked about the issue of ethical recruitment because at the center of ethical recruitment is the issue of direct um, you know, recruitment, which also happens where sometimes there will be agents who are actually, um, before you even look at the issues of push and pull, but where you've got agencies which are also in the countries, which are also in, you know, involved in the recruitment of healthcare workers. Um, there's no doubt about it that um, the, the level of compensation which we have in developing countries, is a bit different from what is happening in the developed countries. Um, and also it goes also into the economic conditions, the GDPs of the countries. However, if um, I were to use an example of our country where in the past uh, 15 um, to 20 years, we have tried um, in a big way to improve the salaries of health workers. We have also realized that by improving the salaries of health workers, on the flip side, we are also having a challenge that we cannot actually have enough money for goods and services. So when you increase compensation of employees, you also have a situation where you might not have enough uh, money for medication and other services that you require. So which means that as, as I've indicated, there's a link between the GDP of the country and the compensation of actually employees. Then we have also looked into other retention policies as I've indicated, like, um, you know, where we, we talked about, um, you know, limited skills where people are compensated, particularly if you are working in rural areas, which needs to be reviewed. We also have uh, many other policies which we are really, really looking into it to see, do they still fit where we are? For an example, when we talk to the issues of imbalance or maldistribution of health workforce, since 1996, we have been having a, a policy on community service. Through this policy, we have been able to ensure that all the, the rural areas and the underserved areas have got health workforce. But with time, we have also realized that the, the, the healthcare personnel which are coming in the market, they are also finding and trying their way to see how can they beat the system. Hence, actually, we need to try and, um, and we are really looking into reviewing some of these policies. So for me, I think um, one of the people also asked, we must look at the root of migration. Why do people migrate and we must regulate? I think as when I indicated the slide, we showed that 
since time memorial, like even pre 1800s, people have been migrating. The fact of the matter is that we cannot deny the fact that you know people will always be moving around. But the issue is that how do we ensure that this is managed in a way that it becomes a, it does not become a, a detrimental issue, particularly for the source countries. I'm saying this because as South Africa, although we become a, we are a source country, we also attract. Um, you know, health workforce from other African countries around us. And um, hence, we have had agreements through um, the South African um, Development Community, which is SADC, to say we are not going to poach, we even use those words from each other. But the health workers find a way of, you know, filtering into the system from, you know, moving from Zambia, moving from Zimbabwe and coming to South Africa and leaving those countries actually underserved. So hence my question about what do we do about the critical shortage of health workforce um, in the source countries um, and how do we address it is because it continues uh, despite yeah. actually the, the efforts that we've put in place to increase the training uh, which even in our country, if you look at the amount of doctors that we're producing in 2010 to date, we have actually yeah. doubled doctors, but we have not actually been able to address the challenges on the ground. I'm just giving an example of doctors, but it, this uh, um, affects or includes all the other categories uh, of yes. healthcare. Thank you. Maggie. Thank you so much, Maggie. Uh, really, that was a, a really good, that was a lesson in the complexity of trying to address um, the, 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 the questions that we are asking. Um, Padam, I'm going to bring you in, but I'm going to actually, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, here as well. You may want to say something about the questions that we've made, but there is a question that's come up from the audience now. I'm moving into, I'm just like sliding into questions from the audience now, um, our participants. Um, and this is like, how do you manage, how do we manage the tension between the rights of individuals to migrate and this particular question that we're asking. And I guess it flows from the discussion we've yeah. been having. I'm going to ask you, and I might come to Agya uh, for your views on that as well. Padam, please. Thank you. Thank you. I think that that's something, it's, it's a quite important and I think disconnected in terms of health worker migration issues. Is a, I agree how the other speaker said. The one is if you talk to the government level, there's a, and when you look at the national number and, and there's always shortage of the health worker in that particular country. When you talk to the individual people, they have a different story. And they, they, their family spent a lot of money to train them as a nurse, as a doctor, and they want to return that uh, investment. And they don't see the prospect of that return when they stay at home country. So, and, and then they are quite keen to leave the country. I was in Ghana a few weeks ago, and I had a meeting with one of the nursing, dean of the nursing school. And, and then they produce very good, high quality nurses in the, in the country. And she also highlighted that, oh, majority of them don't have a job or they, they can't absorb in the country. Although there is a need for this health worker, uh, but the, the, the current mechanism, the government structure health system is unable to absorb the required health worker on that country. And, and there is a dilemma. So that's why there's a, the government, oh, you want to, you have to stay here because we need a health worker. But in other hand, the, the people that they have a different inspiration and, and a different demand and a different expectation. And that's how it's very hard uh, to, um, uh, to, to keep them in the country because the, we, we need to respect the individual right and, and, and choice as well. So the other major problem that I mean, so it's, it's a global problem. I think we uh, I'm working as in a university and, and then uh, as Howard mentioned earlier, we got the 6 million shortage of nurses. Is there any way that we can produce the health workers in, in a slightly different way so that we can produce the required number? The first problem is the first place. When there is a shortage of anything, there's high demand and, and, and that, that the price go up and, and it's a very basic economic theory. And, and then is there any way that I mean, the, the, the training, health worker training that we have been doing that, I mean, so I know there's a, in every university or, or the country is trying to uh, the stem line and, and make it quicker. That, that's something I think uh, the, as, as a global scale that if we have enough health worker globally, then probably that might help 
uh, to, to some extent. And, and the other point that I want to highlight here is a lot of this migration process, the particularly health worker, we are currently looking at the, the Nepalese nurses who migrated to UK and their integration process. A lot of time, the major challenge they face is the recruitment process. So how they they come here and and then the 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 the, the it's a clear lack of a streamline and and then involvement of the broker and involvement of the different route they adopted. So how can we facilitate that so that it it's a benefit for individual and sending country and receiving country? The, the, there are several challenges on this process as well. Thank you. There are several challenges, but um, the, the solutions are probably closer than we think. I, I, From listening to you, that's what I'm hearing. Agia, can I ask you uh, to contribute to that? Yes, um, I think we all respect the right of every individual to move wherever they want to within applicable laws. There is no uh, doubt about that. Um, but at the same time, uh, we also have to realize and government especially have to think about why is this happening? Um, if you remember, there was a labor market uh, slide that I presented, and there are failures. The reason that most people leave are often because there aren't enough employment opportunities or the skills that they have, uh, the qualifications that they have, and what the options are for careers for them are not available. Often there are not enough uh, decent working conditions up to the expectations. Um, management is an issue. Salary may be an issue. And often, um, even if all this is uh, available initially, you know, as a health worker, over time, you want to give your family a better life. So even if the hospital environment itself may be good, you feel you're needed, you have responsibility towards your family, you want to give uh, better education to your children, you have all those requirements which uh, that country may not be able to provide. So when countries invest in health workers, they have to invest in the complete package, not just the education. It's education, employment, and how we retain them. And especially the later part, uh, the latter part of retaining is, you know, it's different in different countries. Why health workers who choose to stay, stay. Um, everybody has a different, uh, you know, uh, priority in life, why they become a health worker, what are their plans. That is one part. Now, uh, governments in a low and middle income country have less financing for health. And within this, the biggest expenditure is often on health workers. And especially post COVID, uh, there has been further constraint on health financing, which not only um, you know, prevents them from employing more health workers, but even has now they are having problems retaining the ones that they already have. And some of these uh, countries have like very old laws that do not allow, um, you know, maybe some health workers want to move abroad for a certain number of years. They want to come back after 10 years. The route is often you have to start from basic. Uh, you can't come up at a higher level and all your experiences abroad are not counted. So there are there is that factor as well. And at the same time, we have high income countries um, where there are strict regulations on um, not increasing the number of education institutions or number of graduates that can be produced at a time when demand is high. So when you have the world's uh, like top economies not investing in their own health systems, but in fact like using health workers from outside, where sometimes governments give full scholarships and subsidies to these uh, health workers, there is an ethical issue. It may be legal, but some kind of investment needs to go back to the source countries to address these drivers, what is driving the youth and the health workers out. And that is how we uh, suggest balancing the right to uh, health of individuals and the right to um, health workers to migrate. And here I would also want to emphasize that, you know, there are selected professions where the qualifications are portable so they can easily migrate. That's one. But there are also other health workers where their degree may be just limited to working in the countries that they belong. And some of these have a significant overlap with the duties performed by these uh, mobile doctors and nurses. For example, in Kenya, there are clinical officers. In Nepal, there are health assistants. They are often at the forefront providing primary health care, but then often you know, in international literature, we don't see them. So some countries have strategies like this, where the exit of one category of health worker is compensated to some extent by other categories. So strategies like this 
also has to be um, considered by uh, these source countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think you both uh, touched on what I would categorize as reform, reform of education, reform of service delivery and models of care. Um, I think that's, a, that's, again, something we could do better by being more collaborative um, across, across, the, across the world. Um, Howard, may I come to you? There's a question um, here, a, a kind of like a, a, a policy question um, about, um, uh, uh, about supporting nurses as they as they move across the world. Um, and it's really um, understanding um, how we strengthen the identification of good practice um, for nurses. And the question here is something I don't know anything about, which is why I'm asking you. Is this the code report? Is this a code reporting year? I don't know what that means. Um, and it's about the code. Um, and if so, um, is there an opportunity for non-state actors to submit reports, evidence that could help strengthen the code? I picked this question because I don't, I'm curious about the answer, please. Thank you. So uh, I, I think that the question is asking about is this is a reporting year for the WHO Code of Practice on International Recruitment. I can see Aggie has got her hand up. So I, I, I think we absolutely go to, to, to Aggie for that. I would just give you, a, I, I believe it is, I think Aggie has said that, that we're, we're, we're at that, we're at that point. Um, and I think it's incredibly important um, that we have much better data, much better reporting, much better transparency on what is happening and what's going uh, and, and, and what's going on. And we've got an opportunity to do that. The three years, is it three years that it's the reporting is every three years? The issue feels more urgent than that to me. It almost feels like there should be an annual reporting and this whole issue around transparency uh, and understanding exactly what countries are doing and what's happening that you know that the the sunshine the light of transparency will i think help to motivate and encourage people as well to look at their practices and their behavior i did within this question though navina before we get at Aggie, I, if i can just um something that we haven't talked about too much and i think it's a really significant issue is in relation to recruitment agencies um i'll be honest with you when i hear of and I do hear regularly of poor and exploitative recruitment practices, nurses who do describe an experience of feeling as though it's almost like a mod form of modern slavery. This is because of the power imbalance that, you know, you're going to go to another country. You're then reliant on the person who's helping you to go there. You may have to, you know, they might ask for your passport. Uh, you know, you're maybe reliant on them for housing or for, or for travel. And if you get there and you find that the promises you were made, the rights you believe that you had are not being respected, you are fearful and worried about raising any concerns or raising any issue on any issues because of the repercussions um, that that will have on you. Now, I do not hear and this is I haven't got any hard evidence of this um, and, and, and I'm making a bit of a generalization, but uh, it's important to share. when I I do hear of excellent practice uh, in terms of recruitment and integration. And often, most commonly, it is a big organisation, a big employer, uh, a big hospital, uh, one of your, you know, one of the, one of an NHS trust. When I hear people talk about more concerning practices, it may often be an agency that one has never heard of, and a perhaps a small private care home. Uh, and I don't, you know, there is good and bad practices across all, all across all. all across all sectors. Um, but the activity of those recruitment agencies, who, sometimes who are these people? Is it somebody just with a mobile phone who says I'm a recruitment agency? They're making big money. There's big, big money to be made in international recruitment at the moment as well. And that, that in a way is part of why the money issue has to come to the center of the table here because the cost of training, the money's being lost. I, you know, personally, I believe that there are, there are agencies who are, who are profiteering at the current time as well. Are identifying who the agencies are, being clear on the age, what the standards are respected, expected of the agent agencies, who is a, who is recognised as being approved and of a high standard. I would even then think about back to my money question: what can be done in countries and what can be done globally as well 
um, to have financial, um, you know, to have to have financial penalties or not penalties, but that there is, you know, let's tax some of the recruitment agencies for the on the profits that they're making and put that into this global health education uh, fund. I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's, you're being hugely naive about how about all of this. How, but I do. I think there's. We do know there's big money being made. We do know that there's practices which are e e exploitative. And we do know that actually it's, it's, it's recruitment agencies. And I hear it time and time again, that a lot of that activity is clandestine. Uh, it's, uh, it, I think Jed's point, Jed's it's point. not discussions up front. It's last minute that people are hearing, hearing, hearing about this. Yeah. So we have to, I think we have to, we have to put recruitment yeah. agencies and what we do on the table as part of this discussion. Back to you. Thank, thank you, Howard. So really a, a reminder, we can't avoid the business aspect of this this whole uh, this whole issue, um, uh, Agia, can you can you very quickly uh, educate me if if no one else uh, on the on the code reporting? Uh... Okay, so um, one of the uh, core provisions of the WHO code of practice is uh, that countries have to report on its implementation every three years. So we at the Secretariat send out the reporting instruments uh, to member states. Uh, but also separate reporting instruments are available for uh, independent stakeholders and private recruitment agencies as well. So we will be launching this uh, in March. Uh, it, the first, uh, it will be the member states reporting instrument, and this will be followed by the reporting for independent stakeholders and private recruiters. This will be in our website, mm -hmm. and you can please write to us at WHO Global Code at WHO, uh, WHO Global Code at who.int and we can uh, share you the link as soon as uh, this goes live. So we collect all this data and then um, it is presented to the World Health Assembly next year. So every th three years, the DG presents on the reporting submitted by member state and the non-state actors. This year, um, the, the review of the code's relevance and effectiveness is also uh, going to start. So the review happens every five years and the code is a dynamic document um, so it can be updated to be relevant. And uh, one of the evidence that is used to inform uh, the review is uh, what we get, the evidence that we get from the reporting. So I would like to encourage everyone to participate, uh, governments and non-governments and independent stakeholders means everyone from education institutions to civil society bodies, unions, professional associations, and anyone who has uh, something to say about the code. Please, uh, keep, uh, you can write to us or please check our website. Yeah. So that's something really uh, practical. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm looking at Jed now thinking that's something, uh, it's a job for you and me, Jed, right? Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, my next my next question uh, from the from the floor really is, I'm going to put it to you, Jed, to start off with. And then um, I'm going to come to Maggie afterwards. Uh, and Maggie, I'm going to just ask you if you people, someone has asked, and I think this is a lovely question. Um, can you, do you have any examples, or even if there is one example of a sort of com a community based intervention, Maggie, that actually helped uh, in this space um, uh, uh, for your development and keeping the workforce in the source country. If you can, if you can um, give us something live, that would be really, really great. But before that, Jed, the question uh, really is, um, what should countries who are um, considering um, um, uh, a, a universal um, healthcare uh, offer um, uh, or healthcare coverage, um, how, how would, should they be factoring in uh, this really important issue? And anyone else who wants to uh, have, a, have a go at that particular question? Jed, your thoughts? Okay, so um, thanks, Levina. The, the first thing to say is that um, there is a lot of collective intelligence in universal health coverage systems across the globe, and uh, certainly from an NHS perspective, we've become acutely aware of this over the next ten years, over the last ten years, and we're really keen on being be, being able to share that collective intelligence. So we've established um, uh, a thing called the NHS Consortium for Global Health, whose purpose fundamentally uh, is to share that uh, intelligence. Of because uh, let's be honest, the, the for those people who've been born in the UK over the last seventy five years, we've been incredibly lucky uh, 
uh, whichever way you look at it. In the lottery of life, we've been incredibly lucky and we've had a, a high quality healthcare free at the point of contact since the day that most of us, uh, probably all of us were born. And I think that that's, that's very fortunate. We've uh, not only have we done some great things over that time, but we also have an incredible amount of scars on our back. And I think those scars prevent um, uh, other uh, universal health coverage systems as they're emerging or can prevent them uh, from going down rabbit holes and spending money unnecessarily. So I think at a, at a G to G and a system to system level, I think we need to share an awful lot more. I think the the uh, in terms of international recruitment and migration, um, I, I go back to to uh, to Howard's bit really. Uh, the biggest mistake I think that people make from a market perspective uh, is throwing money entirely at the demand side without considering the supply. It's a big risk that the modern UHCs have all been guilty of over the course of the last couple of decades. And what that does, of course, is it, it creates unregulated um, market, market practices from the supply side. Now, regulating those market practices is exceptionally difficult. In the UK, we have um, several frameworks which uh, uh, agencies have to apply uh, to in order to uh, to be on. But even uh, those, uh, policing them in source countries is really very difficult. The only real answer to that, of course, is mutuality. So that what we need to be able to to do is have the systems in place to allow us to share information and experience to prevent those practices uh, those practices from happening um, and I think um, uh, I can give you some examples of that we'll go into them now but I think there are examples of where uh, regions and systems and institutions have created agreements uh, which are putting downward pressure uh, pressure on those marketeering practices to try and get rid of them so that would that would be my share 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 is the answer really Navina. thank you thank you um, Jed um, for that. Uh, Maggie, have you, what, what do you think about, uh, have you got an example to share with us? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, before I go to that, I was actually fascinated by the example just given by Ged uh, about uh, throwing money on the um, demand side without looking at the supply side. And um, the interesting part is that we are actually in dire straits because we have actually thrown money on the supply side that is on the training like i've indicated that we have doubled the output of our doctors since 2010 to date but we have not actually um increased uh, the amount of money when it comes to hiring although we still have shortage of health workforce Right now, we are not able to actually appoint the workforce that we have. Earlier on, I spoke about the community service, which is one of an examples that we have in South Africa, which is a policy which was adopted and implemented since 1996. This is happening in a community where we, we are looking at underserved and also the rural areas. So the way it works with community service is that at their final year, all the students, health workforce students, um, nursing, pharmacy, all those, they choose actually five institutions, four to five institutions where they can work. And then, then they are selected in one of the institutions in those areas and they are placed um, to go and do community service. And then this is linked to their ability to, in, to independently practice which means that if they don't actually do that year of community service, they are not able to practice independently. After that, then our health professions can cancel or nursing cancel all our regulating uh, regulatory bodies. They give them actually a certificate to show that this person can go and work independently. So our challenge now comes in after these people have com completed community service to say they are saying, we still want to, to continue to serve. And the challenge that we have now is that our fiscus, you know, our, our financial means to, to appoint them, actually it's limited. So what I think we need to work with colleagues also, and I think we started these discussions in 2020, 2022 when we were in England, um, to, to work on, you know, how can we come up with an investment case as a country to ensure that this um, supply side that we have created, 
we are able to appoint. Because if we don't do that, we we are the, we we cannot actually. Um, I want to use politically correct words, but we leave this health workforce with no choice, but now to look at where else can we get employment. So at the moment, if you look at, um, you know, anecdotally, all the workforces that we've trained, they're saying we want to work, but then the challenge is that how do we appoint them because we do not have the resources. And it is not that the services are not there, there's no need but the issue is that we have not matched that. So we are trying to work on creating and coming up with an investment case so that actually um, when we go to treasury, when the Department of Water and Sanitation, they are making uh, their own investment case about water, but then we are also making an investment case about the need of universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maggie. I think what you just described there is something that's probably happening all over the world. It's certainly happening here in England, uh, really making us, forcing us to think about the importance of integrated planning, where we bring workforce, financial and service planning closer together um, because they're all so dependent on, on one another. So um, thank you for that, that that lovely example. But then it also raises another question um, when uh, uh, out of the work that you've done. Um, Padam, I'm going to come to you, if I may, um, because you described the situation in Nepal and you have got quite a lot of uh, intelligence about the 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 work going across across different countries um, yeah. and in the region and Australia, Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, and so, um, is there something you can think about how countries, those countries maybe, or more generally, mm. could come together more formally uh, to kind of benefit or to prevent shortages? There's the code of practice, but also um, that actually there's that that sort of work that can be done between the, the, the countries that you know uh, 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 your your population are choosing to go to? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I, th I think that's the, the current uh, situation in Nepal uh, in terms of the migration. It's, it's a quite, uh, quite uh, serious in a sense that if you go and do the population, that's very interesting. Uh, the newspaper survey done by one of the newspapers that the eight out of 10 people want to migrate. Eight out of 10 people want to migrate. They did the newspaper, the popular newspaper survey, do you want to leave the country? Yes, I, I, I want to leave the country. I want to go somewhere. And, and that has the big impact on, on the, as I mentioned, that the, the lot of half of the people who should go to the university is now going to the other country. So that has a direct impact on health workforce training and the number of the, the, the trainee who are enrolled in the university and colleges. But the, at the moment, and there's a lack of coordination uh, between the, the country that the Nepalese students are going or studying and, and, and then the Nepal government. So there is a quite disconnected on, on that arena. So definitely there is a, as I mentioned, there is a two different type of quite distinct type of migration you will see in Nepal at this time. Is one is the labor worker go for the labor job. Uh, and, and also the, the other is a, uh, the, the student and other health worker go to the other country to learn to, to develop career. But the majority of them also have a economic motive behind that uh, migration as whether they go as a student or the other motive so yes, uh, that there is a definite need for the the one is the there is a I think the WHO can probably influence is that there is a continuous changes on the the health and medical education system in Nepal that has. Uh, um, the, the significant private education provider and that that's also a bit frustrated and disconnected and also there is not so much regulation to control the quality of those education so that's why the the recently the, the this new bill came out and they said that you have to have a hundred bedded hospital to train the nurses and and then the out of 100 plus nursing college about 73 don't have that they have a connection with the other community hospital or the government hospital and they are not uh, eligible now to train the nurses and um, and there is a big big debate going on between the those education provider and and also the the um, the institution and the government. So the point here is, I think there is a 
more coordination needed in the country level in term of the the this the service uh, education provider medical school private education provider as well as the the, the major destination country uh, and then in those country i mean second largest country for nepalese student is japan and there's a the majority of them go for the language and other courses but there's a lack of those coordination on those one and and then the uh, same as in australia same as in in other countries so definitely there is a need for that level of coordination and, and cooperation and, and a need to revisit that one. Just to, I mean, so when I'm talking, there's a two particular questions that uh, directed to me, people ask uh, from the audience. Uh, the one was asking about this, the, the recent government to government agreement about the North migration from Nepal to uh, Nepal to UK. Probably you can you can answer that one. I I, I hope you can involve on, on, on those, those aspects. And there's another one, uh, the, the Bhagirath asked the question about the oh I met the the recently graduate medical doctor who is planning and doing the plap too what do you think about that so as I mentioned that yes. uh, in Nepal if you are under the government scholarship or supported scheme you have to have certain year of work in the government sector or the community sector but that period is usually preparation period for the people so to that, migrate. yeah so that that yeah. need to be that need to be fixed up otherwise yeah. uh, it it doesn't help in in, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You really that of describing what it feels like for for individuals and for for the population in Nepal yeah. and what, what it means to them. Um, I'm afraid we're really we're running out of time. Um, and there's just, there are so many questions uh, uh, here, but I have one question, which, which is my question. Uh, so I'm going to get it in uh, last. Um, and this is a question for every single one of the pa panel members. You have a huge collective here of, of uh, people who are working in this space. We are, um, it's a it's kind of like a social movement, if you like, as much as people with influence, with power, um, people who have jobs where we can make things uh, better in this space. If you had one, one takeaway that you would really like them to go away and think about and, and do for all of us, uh, what would that, what would that be? Um, and may I ask you to be concise? Only one thing that you can ask us to do, because I don't think I could do more than one thing today. Um, so um, I'm going to mm, I'm going to start with Agya, please. I think at this point, if I were to say only one thing, I would ask um, all the high income countries and the destination countries to invest in the low and middle income countries and countries in the support and safeguards list to address the drivers of uh, health worker migration and uh, migration in general, uh, the social determinants of health. Thank you very much. So that's uh, for us to go back and raise the profile of that particular issue wherever we've come from. Um, Howard. Uh, so, 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 so difficult. But I, you know, I think I would go back to ask people to re-examine, are you doing everything that you possibly can to look after, to support, to retain the current nursing workforce that you have? You cannot afford to lose them. They've been through an incredibly tough and difficult few years. Many of these discussions, it feels as though we're, we come from a negative perspective, but they are wonderful careers and professions that we and the world need if we go to keep going down this road of increasing inequalities it's bad for all of us it's bad for all, all of us so yeah. there's a really positive Sorry. story in this um but let's make sure we're doing all we can to retain the staff that we have yeah and that's within our gift and within our power so absolutely thank you uh howard uh maggie what are your thoughts about one thing we could all go away and do from today um, I think for me, integrated planning will be very important. And for us as newcomers, as people who are still trying to get our bill signed, NHI, which is universal health coverage, we would like to work with countries which have been in the forefront of um, implementing universal health coverage and yeah. see that they have accomplished and uh, what are some the pitfall so that we can learn and move together because we want to ensure that we match the supply that we have and the placement thank you yeah thank you so much Padam. i, I think uh, 
Um, my wish list is, I think the major root problem, what I see is, is the global inequality. I, I think if we reduce the this global inequality in terms of wealth and in terms of development and in terms of other things, I think this migration would, would be the less problem. You, you don't see the, the, the people migrated from rich country to poor country to do the work. And and, and so they, they migrate yeah. throughout the region, but yeah. the is small. Yeah. So I think the root cause is, I think we can tackle those inequality yeah. and, and to solve this, uh, not just the health worker, but the other other bigger yeah. problem as well. Yeah. So a challenge to actually focus also on global health inequalities yeah. as part of the solution. Thank you. Jed? Yeah, you probably know this is coming. So I would get the nine big bad boys, Howard's nine bad boys in a room, the system leaders who are making the decisions about healthcare and say, what are we going to do together to improve the situation we've got at, uh, at the moment? What steps can we take? What investments can we make so that everybody benefits? Thank you very much. Um, so I'd really like to take the last minute to thank our fantastic panel. Um, what a what a two hours gone so quickly, and we could have carried on for ages. I have take my takeaway is really uh, I want to go away and think some more about source country benefits from me. Uh, uh, what is the power that the diaspora brings for all of us? And the second, the final thing is, um, there's so much actually good work happening around the world. How do we share and spread the success um, and, and learn from that? So thank you so much, everybody. There's one question um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put to the team here. I saw somebody ask, there's so much rich material here. I'm going to make work for you. <laughs> uh, I don't think we get, you know, in this chat and everything as well, that, that I know this is recorded so we can go back and look at it again, but is there some way that we pull all this material together into one document? I see people nodding. That's really good. So I look forward to sitting down and looking at that myself and sharing it with all of you. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a really good day, afternoon, evening, um, and see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Do I leave? Oh, okay.